Welcome to Lakeshore Focus, a weekly show highlighting the key issues, important events, and interesting people in our region. I'm Keith Kirkpatrick. Every region of the world has specific people who are notable, some because they are notorious, others due to their unique nature, and some because of the amazing contributions they make. Today's guest might be in all of those categories depending on who you ask. He is a columnist, a radio talk show host, and a published author with two books to his credit. Here he is, a familiar face, or voice, or written word, Jerry Davidge. Jerry, glad to have you on the show. I guess all the above kind of, <laughs> kind of mean, yeah, they all kind of work for me. Which one fit the best, do you think? Written word. The, yeah, that's where I got into the business as written word. Always thinking thing. more of the notorious or accomplished. No, no, or oh yes, whichever. right. Um, no, not notorious. People, when they, when they in, introduce themselves or they find me or recognize me or meet me, they always think that. Like I'm going to be some, ooh, something they read about and they think they know who I am and I'm really not. No, you're just kind of a regular guy who just asks a lot of questions. That's all I do. I'm a regular schmo who asks a lot of questions, exactly. Is, is that how you get all your information? I mean, is that the best way you approach it? It is, I conversationally, yeah. I don't like having a notepad with me and pen and paper or a recorder and stick it in their face. And I don't, you know, address myself as, you know, Mr. Jerry Davidge, calm as that guy. I just like talking, conversing with people. I like to professionally eavesdrop. Well, how do you remember then what you've talked about? I record it. Uh, I record okay. with, an, with an iPhone these days. These days I do that. You still stick it in the face? No, I don't at all. I just lay it somewhere on the side, and if I need it, I have it. If I don't use it, I just delete it. But if the conversation, you know, like merits a column, or if I need something they're talking about, I can extract it from that and get and weed out all the other stuff that they don't, you know, we talk about conversationally stuff, like talk about your mom or your recent trip or your sickness that we just talked about, like off air. I wouldn't need that on a recording because I'm recording you right now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> do, you, do you still meet people who don't know who you are? Because I mean, of course. Pretty, what do you think? But you're you're pretty notable in this uh, in this region. I mean, you've I you've got a column. You've worked for both the major newspapers here. Yeah, right. You right. got a talk show here on on Lakeshore Public. Uh, Casual Radio. Fridays, right? Yeah. Yep. Right. And and then magazine work. I do I do freelance magazines. I have a couple of books, and I'm out doing presentations all the time, public pre presentations. So you're right. But yeah, and I really enjoy that when I meet people, especially, and I could tell either if they know me or, or don't know me, of course, or especially if they know me and they they think they know me, or I angered them with something previously, because I could like divide a room, and I don't mean to. You know, I could walk into a place literally, and people would just either go toward me to shake my hand, say, hi, I've read your stuff for years or something. Or they will totally walk away from me. They will give me no eye contact at all. They'll give me a dirty look and they'll leave the room. How about the, do they ever come up and confront you or like, yeah, they have. I it's, don't like It's kind of doing. rare because most people when they come up to, con to confront, confront's the wrong word, they come up to engage in me, whatever. And, and I'm saying, yeah, I'm Jerry Davich, how are you doing? And, and how do you know my work or whatever? And they say, I've read this, I read that. Well, thank you very much. Once at uh, Flamingo Pizza, one of my favorite joints in Gary to go to, because uh, I was born and raised in Gary. Um, it's in Miller section of Gary. You ever been to Flamingo? No, I don't think so. You got I know where it's we at, should meet there. Okay, it's right by the beach. So I was there having my pizza like I typically do in a weekly thing, and uh, a guy come up to me, hey, are you Jerry Davich? Oh, yeah, how you doing? I stand up. How you doing? Nice to meet you. And he goes, I always wanted to meet you. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, I, I don't get it, it often, but tone, I get it. Right? It was that tone, yeah. He said, I wrote a column about his son who was in an accident. I won't name any names on the air here. And uh, it was in a disparaging tone that I wrote it about because he killed a woman. Under possibly under the influence of some kind of drugs or something, uh, and I wrote this in a column because I, you know, try to write how I feel about things. That's the difference between a column and a story. My columns have opinions. My opinions have bias and prejudice in it. So what what did you say in this that offended him? Well, I said, well, you met me, and uh, you want to talk mm. about it. I'll I'll talk about it with you. No, I just want to look at you. I just want to see who you are, because we weren't supposed to meet there. He was happened to be at Flamingo, and I was there. So I said, okay, and then we stared at each other in awkward silence for like 30 seconds, and I stood up just stared at him back and I said you sure you don't want to talk about this no and he walked away how do you get does it ever bother you that you've done something that really did upset somebody or oh, yeah of course it does but that's like a professional versus personal the personal Jerry I, I, I'm very shy I'm reclusive like leave me alone I don't want to talk with anybody I don't want to do anything public I would never say yes to this show um, but public Jerry you know that that persona of a sorts like you have we all have our public persona that we have versus our private that one says yes to everything. So I'm interviewing the professional Jerry, not the personal Jerry? Well, a mixture of both, because I know you, at least. You know what I mean? And, and you want me to be real, as opposed to some polished talking head official who I interview way too much, or probably you do too. You get nothing out of them. It's like interviewing a mayor who's been a mayor for like 20 years. It's the same polished responses. It's canned responses. It's boring. It's dull. They bore the hell out of me. I, so, I agree with so that. So we don't want that. So I don't want that. So right. when I talk to people, like you said, for my columns, I try to... I try to 
melt away those, those obstacles we already have. Like, you're a mayor, and I'm a reporter, and let's talk about these issues. I don't like doing that. So tell me a story, uh, not tell me a story, tell me about something you wrote sometime, you're like, golly, that really didn't go the way I wanted, or just you kind of regret you wrote it. I have regrets. Some things I'll find out information after the fact, and immediately after I write a column, or with my book, Lost Gary, I found out all this new information that I wish I knew just like 24 hours earlier, or just like six months earlier, whenever it was, and it happens pretty often. And then I hear from people who say, well, this happened to me, this happened to me, the same thing happened to me, write about it again. And I really can't, because that ship has sailed, and I'll do a follow-up column once in a while, which I like to do, but typically I don't go back to columns and revisit them two days later with new information, but so I wish not, I knew. So you're not gonna tell me about this time that you wrote something, you're like, oh. Well, you know, I'll give you an example this. of what something that really still irritates me, and it's been 10 years now. It's been 10 years. The first column I wrote for the Post Tribune, uh, I, I got hired in the Post Tribune in 2006 after working for 10 years at the Times. They said, write whatever you want to write about it. You could write about it, be our columnist, Metro columnist. This is 2006. I wrote about a gentleman, uh, his name is Green. I think it was David Green. He committed a uh, murder. He stabbed to death his uh, wife at the time, who was pregnant. And it, he said it was in self-defense. He was charged with her murder, and he's still in prison today for that. And I wrote about that issue, all the mm -hmm. different ripples of that issue, how why, why they got to that point in the kitchen, why you know he, he killed her for whatever reasons. I talked to the families. I talked to uh, the police, the cops, detectives, whatever. It was, a, it was a big deal. It took a lot of time for my first column for the Post Tribune. It took a couple weeks reporting. And along the way, I interviewed um, the gentleman's mom, Belinda Green. And Belinda was a wonderful woman, invited me to her house before I wrote the column. Here is my son's room where he used to stay. Here's all of his life. And I wrote this column that came out. And in, essentially in the column, I said he is a cold-blooded murderer. Um, like self-defense, my butt is kind of what I said. He killed his wife, you know what I mean? And he's in jail for that reason. And the first phone call I got that morning after that column ran, it was like 6 in the morning, was from his mom, Belinda, who we developed kind of a bond and a mm -hmm. trust. And this good Christian woman kind of cussed me out. She was hurt. She was mad. She was very angry. She was seething. And, uh, and I go, oh, man, what have I got into with this new job of mine? You know, I mean, this is what I want to do, but this is the backlash of that. Well, didn't you write columns before that? I did, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't columns like that, so to speak. It wasn't taking something real life. I would just say my opinions about certain things was under the guise of a column. But the more you write columns and the more you develop these stories, you, you meet people. That people become real. It's like Keith Kirkpatrick becomes real to me, not just some you're the host of Lakeshore Focus, or you're part of L&I who you know, engineer all the L&I stuff. When I get to know you, I get to know you. So a lot of things melt down again, and it did with Valinda and I. So she had this trust with me, and she thought I was gonna write this kind of appraising or a column about her son being self-defensive and all she that. She probably felt betrayed. She's the mom, she's yeah. the mom. She felt betrayed, that's a short answer. Yeah. And I betray people doing that. So we have since reconnected, and we're pretty good friends now, and she understands. I apologize to her in a, in a future column after that, so. Wow. Saying, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, but I still feel this way. So a lot of my columns, I'll say how I feel. I feel like you're guilty or you're innocent. I wrote about a gentleman from Gary named Clifton Boone who was in jail for almost 40 years due to mostly to a legal technicality. He should have been kicked loose after maybe 20 or 15 um, for kidnapping and rape charges. Um, but because of a technicality, his, he was stuck in prison at in Michigan City, Indiana State Prison, for almost 39 years. And everybody was on his behalf trying to get him out, including the superintendent of the prison, the guards, uh, and then finally a local judge, uh, the prosecuting attorney here in Lake County, Bernie Carter, everybody says he deserves to be free. He, he paid his debt to society. He was guilty, but he paid his debt. So I wrote about that, and I still <laughs> caught hell for that, for people saying, no, he committed a crime, he could rot in jail. And I said, no, I disagree with you. He should be released. And he was released uh, oh. two or three months ago, and I've been following him. Wow. Correctly. So in all these years you've written, have you ever written, what piece have you written where it just really, truly touched you? I mean, something is like, wow, this really affected, it affected you, it not affected just touched me. you, but, but it changed who you are a little bit, maybe, well, or how you saw things. Two references. One happened just yesterday when I met a group of Syrian refugees, and they don't want to call themselves refugees because they do kind of have a home here, but they're from Syria or Iraq, and they're displaced, and they're here trying to make a new start of things. They're taking English as second language classes right now, trying to learn our culture, our life, and I'm writing that today for Friday's paper, actually, for tomorrow's paper. So that's in my head. And, and I was sitting with them at this English as a second language class, and they were sharing their, their culture with me and their worries and their concerns, and I could see it in their faces. And it, it touched me like, I can't imagine. Can you imagine going to a different country, not knowing the language very well, at least, not knowing the culture, not having a home, leaving your home here in the Northwest Indiana, another country, and starting fresh and new because you have to? 
And I can see it in their faces and on their, in their eyes. And, and they don't know where to turn. They're looking for help and guidance. They can't communicate well with me. They're trying to struggle with their English. So how did that affect you or change you? It affected me because I forget that. We're so privileged. We forget how privileged we are. I mean, there's always the tag of white privilege, you know, that we have, so to speak. I'm a white middle-aged guy. I get all the perks in life. I'm just some white middle-aged guy from this region. Right. I was born and raised here. I get all the perks that comes with that. They had no perks. So that reminds me, like, these, there's people that just don't have those kind of perks or privileges. They have nothing. And they're so grateful, this group uh, of refugees who are not refugees, they're so grateful, they're so humbled, and they're so appreciative of any gestures that we were showing them. I gave them copies of my book, uh, you know, because they said, well, what do you do, and who are you? And I said, well, here's what I do. I write, I do this, and I gave them that kind of stuff. Very appreciative, humble people. That was neat. You said there was two stories, so what's your second story? Yeah, the second story involves a woman from Hammond named Dorothy Creekmore. Uh, I wanted to do a column uh, many years ago. Actually, it was a story more than a column on hospice care. I was unclear of what it meant. What is a hospice? What does that mean? And the hospice of the Calumet area, you're probably familiar with right. that agency, they contacted me and said, well, write about our agency. And I said, yeah, I'd love to, but put somebody, somebody forward who's involved with your agency. Give me one of your clients, one of your patients, and then I'll write about your, your organization. And they did. They introduced me to a woman named Dorothy Creekmore, who was in, at the time in her 60s or 70s from Hammond. She was dying from terminal cancer. They said, you, she agreed to talk with you. Wonderful. So I went to her house in the Hessville neighborhood of Hammond, knocked on her door, and I expected to see a caregiver or a husband because she's in bed. She has terminal cancer, right? Not true. She had terminal cancer, but nothing really affected her yet. She was fine. She was spry. She was funny. She was engaging. She welcomed me in. I met her husband, Ed, an old hillbilly from Kentucky who really never liked me. And I got to know this couple for weeks and weeks and then months as she progressed along in her terminal illness of cancer. And I followed her from her home to a hospital to a hospice care after she went to an assisted living facility all the way to the end. I was with her the last hours of her life. I was with her until they were feeding her water through a straw. It's all she could take. And she'd read the Bible in her last breaths, and her husband would come and visit her. I was with her all through this time, over a series of months. So again, how'd this affect Dorothy you? Dorothy never, I, she opened up her life to me. Keith, this is the interesting thing about being a writer, is that people open up aspects of their life that you would never think they would do. I've sat across from uh, mothers and fathers who lost their sons or daughters overseas in the war. Uh, remember all the deaths we had locally? It was 04, oh, yeah. 05, 06, all that kind of stuff. Everyone, the death came over, the death notice from the Department of Defense. Next thing you know, I was at these people's homes, knocking on their door like a cold call. It's the worst feeling in the world. Hi, I'm Jerry Davich. I'm with either the Times or the Post Tribune. I heard that you lost, you know, your son was lost in the war. He got killed in combat. Can I please talk to you about it? Those are the worst words to say to anybody. But the trick is, and the wonderful aspect is, they will invite you into their home and they will share these, the most painful moments of their life <clears throat> with me, you know, or any kind of a reporter who it's cares. It's a real privilege. It's a privilege, yeah. just like Dorothy Creekmore. It was a yeah. privilege. She showed me this aspect of her life that. She didn't want to show anybody, really. She wanted to share it with somebody. It's, nobody wants to share that aspect. How different is the radio show that you host here versus doing the column kind of thing? Because it <clears throat> seems a little lighter. It's lighter. That's the best way to put it, yeah. It, it's, actually, our four-year anniversary is next week. We've been oh, doing this four years now. That's so awesome. for the four-year anniversary of the show, we're going to do like a recap of how we got started. And I was looking through some of the old notes, and it says, when I first put this on social media, yeah, Casual Fridays, I had no clue what it was going to be. It's going to be a lighthearted look at my columns or whatever. And it turned out to be just that. It's more lighthearted because the co-host is Karen Walker. She's my fiance. We do the show together for four years now. She's lighthearted. She's funny. And she's, she's still public. your fiance, even though Sorry. you've been doing this for four years. Still right? is, ama amazingly so, exactly. right. So she keeps things more lighthearted. I tend to get to the heavier things quicker. I mean, I, like, I wanted the show to be purposely kind of lighthearted, but I, would, I like to gravitate toward back the heavier I sort of say, how do you keep that balance that you don't? Because you, you do like to probe. I so, do. so when you've got that guest or that conversation going, that you're like, God, I want to know more. I want to dive into this. Yeah, you know, one How of the um, one of the promos we do on the show early on, I did. We it's a Bob Hope quote. He says, "I like to needle people, but I don't draw blood." So I try to keep that in mind that I like to needle people, and I really do love to needle people. If I was interviewing you right now, I'd you'd be all over all your belief systems and what you do and why you do it. I should do that sometime. Have you interviewed? You should have anybody be. just interview. Yeah. Turn the tables on you a little bit, yeah, because we think we know people. Like people think they know you. You were mentioned. You're going to mention how people watch Lakeshore Focus. They're fanatics of the Focus, that kind of stuff. And but do they really know Keith Kirkpatrick? Probably not so much. You ask most of the questions. You come off. You have your tie. Who's this guy behind the stuffed shirt? That's what I want to know. What makes you tick? Why are you still Northwest Indiana? These are questions I'd ask. Yeah, it's interesting because I had Dan on, Dan Lowry, who did the first four years of this, uh, and, I, and we actually switched chairs and talked about, you know, 
trying to interview each other. But it is funny when you're in this chair, it's just you become the interviewer. You do. You know, you just keep asking the questions. And the you same do. way when you're in that role, uh, you know, doing, I think, all of your stuff for the paper and your writing, it just you're in that. You get on a roll. Constantly. And it seeps over. So it does seep over into my radio show and it seeps over into normal conversations. I can't help it. I can only talk to so does Karen. Does Karen say it steeps over into your personal life? Uh, oh, you she definitely does. Questions? She could tell. She could tell if we're at a gathering or a wedding and we're sitting and dining and chatting. Next thing you know, I'm probing somebody about some issue that matters to me about the day. Or so, something. what does she say to you when you're doing nothing, that? Nothing at all. She didn't elbow you. And Not say, at all. No. Up. She knows who. She knows how I'm wired. She knows who I am, and so do I. And I, like I said, I, I needle people just to ask questions. But if somebody wants to engage with a debate, well, then I say, you know, look. Well, Gauntlet down, game on, let's have fun. So why did you choose to write the two books? The first book is called Connections, Everyone Happens for a Reason. And I wrote that book. That's right here, right? Yeah. You got it yeah. here? I wrote that five years or so ago. And the reason why is because I kept saying no to things I should have said yes to. I kept missing connections. Uh, connections would open up to me. Like Keith Kirkpatrick would have called me uh, five years ago or more. Jerry, would you like to be a guest on my show? We'll talk about your books and your columns and your radio show. It's a great platform. No, no thanks. Personal Jerry just didn't want to do that. So I would, just, I would close doors on things all the time. And I noticed that I had a revelation once with my cousin, who's the co-author of the book, Dennis Berlin. And, and, he's, and I said, man, I've missed so many connections in my life, Dennis. And he said, you should write a book about all the connections you've missed. And I go, man, I really should write a, a book on that. So I did. So it's called Connections. Everyone, everyone happens for a reason. Because I learned in my life, especially in this region, it's not everything that happens for a reason. It's everyone. These people who we know, like you, you mean, meeting you, you've opened so many doors to me for sources for my columns, for the LNI, uh, for this kind of exposure, whatever it might be. It's not always who you know, it's what you know. And it's not always what you know, it's who you know. It's so kind of both. is there one connection that was more dramatic than any other that you missed? That I missed? Mm -hmm. Oh, man, there's too many that I missed. I really did. I mean, I Not one I got, that you regret more than another one. I don't think so. I got into this business like 20 years later than everybody else. I mean, I used to do a food business for 20 years. That's what I was doing, food business. And um, What would you do? We own a catering business, a food catering business my family okay. did. It was called Uncle's Catering. Hmm. And I did that since I was a sophomore in high school into my 30s. Really? Yeah, and we were working. We had catered to the you mills. You didn't name it anything besides it just couldn't have been Uncle Jer or something? No, my dad started the business. It wasn't my <laughs> idea at all. I just got into it to help out the family. I didn't expect to be in it for 20 hmm. years. You know how things kind of they take yeah. you over. It's like guys who go into the mill for five years just to make a lot of money and leave. 38 years later, they're still there. You so know? media is your second career. Yeah, yeah, I don't belong here at all. This is all an accident. It, trust, it really is an accident. Here's how it started. I was drawing political cartoons for kicks when I took some classes. First, I didn't graduate high school. I don't know if we ever told you that. Hmm. So I had to get a GED after the fact. And I, in my 30s, I was going through all these existential books and, and ideas and stuff. I was reading Jean-Paul Sartre and Dostoevsky, and I was getting into sociolo sociology and anthropology. And I took some courses at PNC, Purdue North Central, just mm -hmm. for fun. I was raising two kids in diapers. I took them with me to classes, had some fun. While I was there, Kurt Cobain, lead singer of Nirvana, took his life, remember, committed suicide. Mm -hmm. I wrote a column on that just for fun. I gave it to the school newspaper and to my English professor at the time, just for fun. He says, why don't you hand this into a local newspaper? And I said, you're crazy, nobody's gonna run this thing. So I, I handed it into the Times and the Post. The Times published part of it, and at the same time, I was doing some political cartoons, again, just for fun, just to communicate. For example, remember when the first casino boats came to this mm -hmm. region? Sure. Trump did it, Donald Trump came right. in, and, it, and they had this mystical, magical, harbor that they put it on, it was called Buffington Harbor, right? It wasn't Gary, like don't come to Gary, Right. come to Buffington Harbor and blow all your money there. Did, I mean, you, draw, did you draw a picture of a boat with a large hairdo? No, Sorry. but I drew a picture of the boat and says, welcome to like a, a Buffington Harbor, we are no affiliation related to Gary, you know, kind of thing, because that was, that was the whole thing. They didn't want people to come to Gary, they're trying to come to this other place called Buffington Harbor, it's inside Gary, but you know, they didn't want to say that. You know, it's so funny, you just kind of fell into this career in some yeah. ways. And how, you, when we talk to young people all the time, how they're like, oh, I want to figure out what I'm going to do and yeah, what I'm going to do. Right. It's like, you just should listen to the stories of all the people whose careers have evolved, you know? And even this book, it just sounds like it evolved for you. So how did the second one come about? Lost, Lost Gary, Gary came about, History Press has a series of books called Lost Washington, D.C., Lost Detroit, Lost Boston. They asked me, because I was born and raised in Gary, I'm a writer for, for Gary, do I want to write a book called Lost Gary, Indiana? And I, of course, being stupid as a businessman, I said no to them like three or four times uh, about a year and a half ago. They kept asking me again, and I finally said, okay, I'll write the book, but what do I have to do? Because I didn't think I was the authority to write this. I mean, there's a lot of experts to know Gary. I was just born and raised in Gary, one and I write. One of my favorite posts, 
postings on Facebook from you was the picture of you with a stack of these books at the counter of one of the bookstores, and it's like the books are flying off the shelf. Oh, now we know why, or something like that. Yeah, I, I ran out of books. <laughs> I ran since the book is is <clears throat> is really popular. It's doing much better than I expected it to do. I'm, I'm a pessimist. You know, so how how many have you sold? That. Well. The, the publisher hasn't really told me yet. I okay. get like a royalty figure at the end of the year, and I really don't know. So I figured if it sold more than 50, it was more than I expected <laughs> from my hands. Honestly, I right. really did. I thought it'd go to, you know, whoever, some people from Gary, maybe diehards, a few experts who want to criticize the book, and my mom you might buy the book, and that's about all I expected. So I don't know. It's selling really well, and I've been purchasing books on my own to sell on my own at my presentations. And I ran out of books, so I had to go back to Barnes and Noble and say, "Could I buy 15 copies of my own book for a presentation tonight?" So that's what the photo they caught me at the counter buying my own book. That was funny, though. <laughs> so I can sell them. Who took that picture? Them. Karen took her. Photo. Okay. Yeah, she was with me. <clears throat> she busted you. She busted right me there. exactly right. So. so, so tell us one one thing out of the book that would intrigue somebody to want to pick that book up and read it. Well, you know, the book was supposed to be about a history of Gary back in the old days. It's heyday. It was a model city. It was called Industrial City, Magical City, all that kind of stuff. So I, that's in there. The history is in there, all, the, all that's in there. But what I found interesting is I tried to bring it into contemporary times. Uh, history Press wanted me to stay in the past. I demanded to come to the future. What happened to Gary? Was it uh, White Flight? Was it the mills? Was it strictly commerce? Was it Hatcher? Was it, that's all in the book, all these ideas. But what I did, I asked the current mayor, Karen Freeman Wilson, during an interview for the book, Karen, it's like Karen, not Mr. and Mrs. The mayor. Right. Karen, what do you think happened to the city? What's lost most in the city of Gary? It's the book is Lost Gary. And she goes, well, besides the commerce, which is obvious, there's no commerce right. there. She goes, pride. There's no pride. Hmm. We lost our that's pride. Interesting. And that stuck with me. Well, people ought to read that book. We could probably talk on for, an, for another hour, I think, because uh, you're interesting not only asking questions but answering questions. So I really appreciate you being on the show, and I'm looking forward to we'll still probably do our end-of-the-year wrap-up about stories of the year with, but Krista. with, with Krista coming up. So Let's do it for sure. Well, everybody watch for that. So thanks for coming on. Appreciate sure. it, Jerry. Thank you, Keith. All right. I want to end this show a little differently. Instead of my profound thoughts about the topic of the day, I'm going to say thanks. I really appreciate those of you who watch Lakeshore Focus, and particularly the ones who are fanatic Focus fans. I meet you on the street or bump into you at a public event, and you say, hey, I caught your show last week, or that was really an interesting guest you had on the show about whatever. These comments are so much better than the you look familiar to me, but I don't know why. Luckily, I don't have to connect it to a most wanted poster or a news article where my picture was aligned with some act of stupidity. I usually ask if they watch Lakeshore Public Television, and the look of recognition then comes over their face, or not. For those of you who do not know me personally, this is me. This is my face. I am Keith Kirkpatrick. Watch for me walking the streets of Valparaiso. Look for me in the grocery or hardware store. Introduce yourself to me at some public event. I really would like to meet you and hear your feedback about the show. Identify yourself as a FFF, Fanatic Focus fan. That will let me know who you are and that you're crazy enough to call yourself a 3F. Otherwise, you can always email me at focus at lakeshorepublicmedia.org. I also want to encourage you to look at the lakeshorepublicmedia.org website. Each week I remind you that nearly a hundred of our previous shows are posted online. I tell you to go to the fabulous website and click on the TV tab, scroll down until you see this distinguished face, and then find a show that you want to watch. From time to time I will highlight one of these episodes to entice you. Today's suggestion is a show from March of 2014 number 812. When I interviewed a doctor and his daughter who had gone to war-torn Syria to help struggling refugees and search for their missing family. It will stir your emotions. Again, the show is number 812. I think it will touch you. Until next week and another Lakeshore Focus, I'm Keith Kirkpatrick saying, make a positive difference in our world today.